Welcome to the Dr. James Cousins Lecture Series on Southern Alberta History, recorded in 1974. Nature has been kind to Lethbridge. She gave her high winds to prevent an accumulation of dirt and rubbish. <laughs> T.E. Saunders, editor. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's a start. And the weather, you know, the, this is the, the place of all places in the world where the weather is perfect. And to a Chamber of Commerce newspaper, which all local newspapers are, you must never damn the weather. You must always praise it. And therefore, occasionally, the editor does get exasperated, and uh, he goes beyond what the Chamber of Commerce would expect. For instance, one, uh, little, one weekend, uh, he put up on the top of the personal column, wind, wind, wind. Will it never stop? 1886. <laughs> it hasn't stopped yet. Then the hope of it going to. And another one that amused me very much was he wrote this on the heading because anybody who knows Lethbridge realizes the humor in this. He wrote rain, rain. And then he put mud, mud. <laughs> That's mud. Great. That's, that's great. <laughs> and the ratio was three to two. You, <laughs> you get more mud than you get rain. And this uh, is the thing that I find so interesting. And it's the uh, my attitude towards history is usually the people in it, the social history. So that in order to cover this, I, I'm going to go back and, uh, and jump all over the place for a while till I get you all lined up. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to victimize you to this extent. I've been making a very close study of the early history of Lethbridge up until the time it was incorporated as a town in 1891. The people, their organizations, how they worked, and so on. Because my idea was, I think, I hoped that I'd have a few of the old timers here who could remember back, say, to 1905, and then they could tell me, and I wouldn't have to look that up, you see. <laughs> because um, the, the history of this area is, 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 is very strange. Because we have periods when uh, Lethbridge, McLeod, and Pincher Creek, with a few people that stand off and, uh, and the other place slide out, is the whole of civilization as far as the white people are concerned in southern Alberta. And so that everything in the newspaper is Lethbridge, McLeod, and they're back and forth constantly all the time. Well, when settlement comes along and you have these railways being built, then people come up out of the valleys onto the benchlands and then you, you get the, the, the southern Alberta that we know now, the, the southern Alberta that I first saw in 1921 when I was a youngster coming out here, complete, orderly, fences around each quarter section, beautiful <coughs> dirt roads, or at least road allowances all over the place, no gravel roads yet, no paved roads yet. Uh, Calgary was a big city of about 40,000. It always had big city airs, Calgary did, even when it was about the same size as Lethbridge. And uh, uh, the towns, as, as we know them today, you know, the Clare's Home and the Stavely and the Carston and so on, all fixed, and that pattern hasn't changed, although we've seen a decline of some of these towns in the meantime. But uh, this area, and the reason why I've chosen it, uh, is this. And, uh, I think we've done it deliberately, because if you take the Bow River down this way and keep south of that, you'll find that what you've got is a nice little area with the mountains along here. Then you got the sweet, uh, the uh, Left River Ridge here, and you got the sweet grass hills there. And then there was a line up here. Uh, this was the line between Assiniboia and Alberta. So Madison Hat was in Assiniboia. It doesn't belong in our country. But uh, uh, what you can see then is that with the Bow River coming down like this, you've got a corner in here. And you say, well, why would anybody pick that corner? Well, the answer is that's the Chinook corner. And that's also the whoop up corner because this is the only way you can really get up into southern Alberta easily. Because the, the sweet grass hills, if anybody's going west, they're not going to turn north into that unless they're looking for gold. Uh, so they're going to wait till they go past that and then they're going to turn north in that wonderful little alleyway between Coots and Lethbridge before uh, they, they turn north again. Like now, when the Mormons came up through, they had to uh, do it the hard way, like find a bump and then find a hollow with a bump and go through the hollow. Uh, this is Whiskey Gap, Emigrant Gap, that uh, is so noticeable, but you have to look for gaps when you have a situation like that. Now, when it comes to uh, the mountains, then, uh, we've got a number of passes, Crow's Nest Pass, North Kootenai Pass, Middle Kootenai Pass, South Kootenai Pass, 
I come into class and so on, the whole bunch of them all down in there. So that there is a tendency, and this is what you'll notice when I get to the Crow's Nest Pass, to find that we are influenced by British Columbia a great deal. And uh, when Lethbridge was founded, its interest was immediately in getting through the mountains to the west, to the fabulous Kootenai ledges, to the coal of the Crow's Nest Pass, which had been discovered and known for quite a while. So that uh, really, the, the Crow's Nest Pass, when it was discovered, then was discovered from the west. It was part of the British Columbia gold rush. Uh, they spilled over. And so that when I was looking through some of my books, one of the books was Kootenai Brown, His Life and Times by William Rodney is one of the books that I have on the list. And you'll find that Kootenai Brown simply skidded over the mountains and got in here from the British Columbia side. Uh, this was the British Columbia that James Douglas was trying so hard to keep from becoming Americanized. Remember, he put the gold commissioners on the border and said, now you damn Yankees, when you come up here, you remember you're in British territory. He had no authority to do that, but uh, Mr. Um, um, What's his name had been in Oregon at the time when the Oregon was in charge of the Hudson Bay Company and it was well settled, it was a good peaceful country. And the American settlers came in and said, well, I guess what we need now is a good democratic election, election and kick out all those damn monopolists of British origin. And uh, one of the men who was kicked out in that Oregon dispute was James Douglas. And he was the one who had helped to found Victoria so that we owe him a lot in the fact that British Columbia enables us to go from east to west, from Amari Usque Admari, you know, from east, from sea unto sea. So that uh, we've got this little corner down in here. Uh, it always makes me think uh, of Homer, you know, the plains of windy Troy. <laughs> well, this is, these are the plains of windy Wupa. The, uh, <clears throat> now, as far as this country was concerned, we have, in the earliest days, uh, at least according to our um, archaeologists and anthropologists, we had settlement here from about as far back as the Ice Age. Uh, Terry, um, heck, fellow in anthropology anyway, told me not too long ago that they had found a certain skeleton <coughs> down in, so many feet below the surface in, uh, in Tabor, and he was wondering why nobody had taken that up. He was going to study it himself because it indicated that there might have been people here as long ago as 20,000 years. So the, the dispute that broke out between the archaeologists was whether the uh, Blackfeet came here or whether they'd been here all the time. And uh, Dr. Forbes in, uh, in Calgary in the Department of Archaeology there, and Hugh Dempsey to a certain extent, uh, worked on that and said, no, they, the Blackfeet have been here all the time. See, uh, most of the normal histories will say they migrated from a certain place and they came in this direction. And uh, what Hugh Dempsey uses as his evidence is that um, there is no legend in Blackfoot that indicates uh, dislocation of population. For instance, the Greeks came from the north into Greece. And their legends show that because you find them claiming that uh, their ancestors were gods who lived in the mountains, Mount Olympus, which was in the north and that they had mated with human women, I don't know what the human men were doing at the time, <laughs> and produced a race of demigods called heroes. And they had come down into Greece and performed all kinds of miraculous <coughs> uh, adventures and so on, and, and uh, Hercules, or whatever, I think, was, was one of them. So that's what I mean by a legend that implies a dislocation of population. But according to Hugh Dempsey, there aren't any such legends among the Blackfeet. So we can let the archaeologists fight it out and say, well, have they been here all the time? Now, on the actual grounds and where they've been digging, they find, for instance, in a little uh, depth about that much, seven or eight hundred years. And uh, the, uh, right down here, just about a couple of inches down, they were making pottery. So you can almost spot the point where white man's iron came in, because, as Fiddler says in, in, in one of his books, they made their arrowheads out of pieces of pots and pans and little bits of metal and old axes and spoons and whatever they had. And when he met the Kootenai Indians, they were still using stone arrowheads. Uh, so that uh, you can see from the archaeology where they started to get pots and pans from the white men. And uh, over in um, this um, dig at McLeod, they've gone down and down and down. They hoped to find some artifacts, but they went way down 
to what they figure about 10,000 years ago, and they find chips of, uh, that indicate uh, artifacts that have been worked, but they haven't found any actual artifacts down at that depth. But the point is that in certain places here, we find that people have been living here for at least 10,000 years. And uh, the fact that they find uh, bones of buffalo that are now extinct indicates that they've been here a long time. And uh, all our uh, cultural anthropologists, you know, they, they make all these studies. They study the animals and they, they tell us what the weather was like and what changes we've had in the climate and all the rest of it. Um, but the uh, point is that this has always been an area in which there has been good hunting. And in our times, it's, it was the uh, area in which the Indians spent their winters. And uh, as I go along, I, I'll, I'll read you some of those things and you can get some idea. Now, the, the way I usually start a course of this nature is to quote something that struck me as very, very peculiar in a book that I picked up. The book was simply called Birds of Southern Alberta. And, uh, well, there's nothing spectacular about that. That should sound all right. I looked at the date and it said 1948. Well, that was all right, too, until I read the introduction. And uh, it said it has been the desire of the Department, of what Department of the Interior, I think it was, to compile a, a book describing all the birds known in Canada. But we found that there was one area in which there was very scant information. <coughs> Can you guess what it was? <laughs> Us. So they must have sent, they sent a fellow out, I don't know, on a motor scooter or something in 1948, and he rushed around and he counted birds, and maybe he chased birds in and counted them, I don't know, it wasn't a very good book. But the point that I'm getting at was, this was unknown country. When they knew of the birds of the Arctic, when they knew the birds of the Pacific coast and the birds of the mountains and the flora of the mountains, they didn't know anything about the bottom left-hand corner of the prairies, which I've been calling it all my life. Uh, in other words, this area was one that was not known to the white man, and uh, I suppose there are lots of reasons why. <coughs> uh, for example, um, the fur companies never really came in here. The closest that they came to this area is, um, where did I find it? Right here at Empress, that's Chesterfield House. And up the Bow River from Calgary is Bow Fort. And those two were the closest that the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company and the XY Company came into this area. And uh, you will read in a number of areas that uh, there, first of all, there were no good furs in the area. And secondly, the Indians seemed to be self-sufficient. And then the best furs were along the tree line, along the edge of the uh, plains and the trees, and so, so the tendency was to travel northward, and uh, in the old days, you know, it was Cumberland House and Norway House and so on, but towards the end, that is in the, in the last part of the fur trade, when they were important, they were going from Fort William to Fort Gary to Fort Ellis in Saskatchewan to Fort Carleton, just south of uh, Prince Albert, and across to Fort Edmonton to Rocky Mountain House. Now, that was the path, and that was where the railway was going to go. And you'll find when I'm talking about uh, gout, that when the decision was made almost at the last minute to change the CPR and push it onto the plains instead of following the old fur route, it brought the plants of gout to life again to mine coal in this area. If the railway had gone north, gout would never have been able to get money to start mining here. So that area it is very important. The fact that that's the fur trail, and uh, when you read about explorers, for instance, out of three that were sent out to explore the country, uh, Robinson Ross, Butler, and uh, Palliser, only Palliser came in here. And he came here in one heck of a hurry as if he were holding his nose or holding his breath and rushing out again. Uh, because they were afraid of something, and of course what they were afraid of was the Indians. The, the Indian didn't need the white man, uh, he could sell enough pemmican to get what he wanted, which was tobacco, and uh, uh, they liked that grog once in a while, which was a well-watered rum. The Hudson Bay Company didn't put uh, red ink and uh, alcohol, I mean, coal oil and stuff in it the way um, Al uh, what's his name, Alec Johnson's uh, whiskey traders do. <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, 
you'll hear, you'll read about Fiddler. Now, I, I'm come to Fiddler in a little while, but I want to show you something. This book is not here. I was given permission to look up Peter Fiddler's journal in uh, by the Hudson Bay Company. I copied it out. I found I'd copied it incompletely. Um, Hugh Dempsey had copied it completely, so I got the complete copy from him. I had two copies made. I, I bound them. I put one in the library, and I have one of my own. And uh, it's the description of this country by the first man who really spent the winter in, in this area. But officially, it's not been released. The Hudson Bay Company does not give permission uh, for anybody to read it but me and Hugh Dempsey. <laughs> <laughs> So I put this in the library. It's not for circulation, and I'm sure it's circulated. I've given it to lots of people to read, and I'm sure they've read it. And, uh, but it's from this uh, journal. Uh, it's called um, A Journey from Buckingham House to the Rocky Mountains in 1792 and 93. And uh, it's not available, and this is the reason why I, uh, I have to sort of make it up as I go along. Now, another, there are a few other things about this country that, that helps to keep people out. In the first place, uh, it's not very good farming country if you farm the way the farmers did in Oregon or in eastern Canada. It wasn't until they discovered the, the technique of dry land farming that this land was any good. There was a great shortage of water until irrigation came along. And uh, secondly, we were very lucky because there was no gold in any of our creeks. If there had been, we'd have been had Americans swarming up here the way they were in British Columbia, and there was no James Douglas up here to hold them back. And uh, we probably wouldn't be regretting it because we wouldn't be here. But they were here. Uh, some of them came up, but they didn't find gold, and so they went back to Last Chance Gulch and south of uh, Billings and all those areas and stayed away from us. So that. Uh, that's the reason why I say we are, uh, we, and I use the word unique, meaning the, the French meaning, meaning only. There's nothing like it. And we'll all agree to that. One of the healthiest places in the world. I'm beginning to sound like the editor of the Lethbridge News now. <laughs> <laughs> when I come to that part, I'm, I, I think I'll have to play you some of the tapes because I couldn't copy out the descriptions that he gave of Lethbridge with the winds blowing down from the mountains onto the plains, you know, and where uh, yesterday, the winds uh, blew unheeding across the empty plains. Today there are 200 houses and 50 stores and 600 people, no, 16, 1,200 people, and so on. Well, uh, now what I'll do now is I'll go over here and I'll read a little difficulty that I, I had, and that is, how do we find any reference to this country at all? So that's the first thing, is the early exploration of the prairies in relation to this part of the country. Now, it has been possible for four or five centuries to find latitude quite accurately. Because Champlain was able to do it in 1604, and uh, other people were able to do it before that, because it was simply a matter of getting the angle of the sun, and so was there astrolabes and all the rest of it, they could find latitude. But longitude was a hard thing. They never could tell how far. They had to use dead reckoning. And a lot of their reckoning was about as dead as some of the reckoning and some of the students I've taught. They never were not. For instance, when La Salle came out to settle New Orleans, you know, he didn't know where he was and he landed up somewhere in Galveston, Texas. Because by his reckoning, he was right at the mouth of the Mississippi. <laughs> it's way over here. And they had no way of knowing. Now, the land men were able to, uh, by the 18th century, they had pretty good instruments uh, in, the, in the nature of watches, diamond jewels and all the rest of it. And uh, by certain stars, they would adjust them. And so by that time, they were able to locate the longitude fairly well. But most of the time, they just didn't know where they were. It was all right for ships, but uh, on land where men were uh, away from exact time for years at a time their watches would get out. So explorers then would um, simply say, well, we travel in the average of 20 miles a day or five and a half miles a day when the women are with us or something like that. And you have to guess. Well, for instance, I followed Fiddler's journal very carefully. And by the time he had got down to where Calgary is, according to his measurement, he was down to a task when uh, 
Yeah, I think he was uh, uh, taking longer strides or shorter strides or something because uh, he estimated he'd covered five and a quarter miles or something, and he probably had only covered three or four. Well, so that it's uh, uh, only when there's some landmark, such as uh, Lewis and Clark finding the Black Eagle Falls or the Great Springs at Great Falls or the Shoshone Canyon near Cody, Wyoming, then you know where they are, but from their journals you can't always tell. And this is why uh, the maps of David Thompson are so noteworthy, because they were the most accurate maps that had been made by any traveler up to that time. He used the stars, so um, whereas nobody on this earth knows where Radisson went when he went north, we guessed everything from Lake Nipigon to Hudson Bay, because he, uh, he traveled so many days and so many canoes, and he, he figured, by gar, he make that many mile, and, and that many mile, uh, not so many mile, he think, and uh, uh, when he comes back, and then, to make it worse, he writes his journal down in English. <laughs> People have been struggling with, with Radisson's journal for, for a good many years trying to figure out where he went. But he went home and he, he uh, got the Hudson Bay Company started. He went right out to Hudson Bay and started trading. So maybe he did go to Hudson Bay, but he sure can't go by his measurement. So you will appreciate, then, the amount of, of uh, work that went into J. Uh, G. McGregor's uh, searching uh, um, Hende, because when Hende, Anthony Hende, came west here about 1753, uh, we didn't know where he was. Uh, now, uh, McGregor tracked him by following landmarks and finding where he was, this valley, that hill, this river, another river coming in, and so finally he, he figured that this man had not come into southern Alberta as they had thought, but spent the winter in the woods west of Red Deer. He was in the woods. If he had not been uh, in the woods, he would have had, had to get out of the woods. He'd have had to come a lot farther south. And uh, now, La Verandre is another good example. Mrs. Bundy, Mrs. Frieda Graham Bundy of Cowley, used to be a good amateur historian, and she came up one day with a little plaque about this size, and it said on it, Posé par le Chevalier de La Verandre, and then they put the date down. Uh, and uh, she said, aha, uh -huh. so La Verandre posed this thing here. And uh, so she said, La Verandre was out in Cowley, Alberta. Well, uh, I had to check that because I was doing the Crow's Nest Pass. I thought, my God, that's a good place to start, La Verandre at Cowley. Well, by the time I got it through, I had to go to Fort Pierre, South Dakota. I had to go down to the National Archives. And I saw the original plaque. The original plaque is about the size of this tape recorder here, about that big. And this one was a copy of it, and it had been put out by the Great Northern Railway, but for some reason or other, the one that got to Cowley didn't have Great Northern stamped on it. And uh, uh, Dr. K. Lamb says, well, if he could have scratched it on that big plaque and then copied it exactly on the little one to scale, he must have been a far better artist than anybody's ever given him credit for. So, bang, went another bubble, and uh, I, I didn't have anybody coming into Southern Alberta. I thought, well, at least we got a very important uh, explorer. And it's rather interesting, when I got down to the United States and asked if I could see the La Verandre plaque, they just looked blank at me and finally said, oh, you mean the Verandre plate? Yes, oh, we have that here. <laughs> so I saw the Verandre plate, I took a picture of it and all the rest of it. Well, so I had to backtrack. Now, where did La Verandre go? Well, he went into the Black Hills, because when I went down there, I went to Bismarck and then to Pierre. I was about a th 150 miles, and then I went west through the Badlands, 50 miles to the Black Hills. Now, he was supposed to have said, Behold the Shining Mountain. All right, from the Black Hills, I went 200 miles west to Sheridan, Wyoming, crossed the Bighorn Range, which doesn't shine, and then I went 220 miles west, and I got to Yellowstone. And then, behold, the Shining Mountains. Well, Laverandre didn't get that far in the few days he was riding on horseback. Therefore, we've got to conclude that Laverandre didn't get to Cowley. He got to the Black Hills, and the Black Hills are really mountains, and they're granite, and they're the shining mountains. So, being with another bubble, you see, we just lose out all the time. Surely somebody's going to come here sometime, don't you think? Well, Lewis and Clark, well, they came close. Because if you remember, the Louisiana Purchase took in the whole basin of the Mississippi and Missouri. Well, that uh, takes in the Milk River and Milk River, and Coots, you see. 
for a gift from the gods when they set that boundary in 1817 and stole a bit of Manitoba from Lord Elgin. They gave us Coots, Milk River, and we've been happy ever after. And uh, the weather, of course, is much better in Milk River than just in Alaska because they're in Louisiana. <laughs> the weather in Louisiana is much better than it is in Canada. Well, um, now Lewis and Clark's journal um, was, oh, was several ed editions of it. And one of them, this is what started me on Fiddler, by the way, it was uh, put out by um, an American historian who said that when Lewis and Clark were down, they were looking for a unique mountain peak which had been called the Tooth by Peter Fiddler, uh, a Hudson Bay Company man who claimed that he had been down there. And the footnote said, Hudson Bay Company people very often claimed that they were in places they had never been in order to claim more territory. Typical Yankee stuff. This is DeVoto <laughs> that, that said that. Now, the Hudson Bay people never claimed that they had been where they hadn't been because they had to go back there and trade very often. And mm -hmm. It was no use trying to guess something. You, you just had to have it. So um, the tooth, of course, is the Grand Teton. And I finally got a copy of the map that was made by Arrowsmith on the information that had been given to Fiddler by one of the Indians of the land to the south. For instance, uh, this peak is to the north of the Brackish Sea. Any idea what the Brackish Sea is? Salt Lake. <laughs> Brackish water, you see, as far as he was concerned. And uh, the uh, interesting thing about this the Indians, you know, had an obsession with women's breasts almost as much as the white man has. <laughs> and uh, the result is anything of that delightful and delectable shape was called that by the Indians. And it's interesting to notice uh, the names that were given to them at different periods. For example, uh, the Grand Teton in French. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like an English. <laughs> one of the, one of the uh, air hostesses said that it meant big sweater girl. <laughs> well, look, look what Fiddler called the Sweetgrass Hills. The three buttes, he called them the three paps. <laughs> That's 18th century. Now, what do they call this thing west of us here? <laughs> Squaw's tit. <laughs> That's 19th century. <laughs> now what does the pure Ottawa people call it? Squaw Butte. It's a butte, all right, but not the kind that they spell. <laughs> but, uh, it's so interesting to, to see uh, the Indian's naturalness about naming things, and apparently he was uh, interested in anatomy to a certain extent. And I, I always get a kick out of the three paps, because the pap to us today doesn't mean quite what it meant to Fiddler. Well, um, now, Clark's maps, you see, had been based on this supposed journey, but um, they never were able to find uh, the tooth, although they came close to it. Now, Lewis and Clark missed the Milk River. They didn't find the Milk River at all on their journey across, but they came up to Shelby, and they came to a large stream in 1806, and Mr. Clark had a girlfriend whose name was Mariah Wood, and it was her birthday. So he said, well, this shall be Mariah's river. And he said, of course, it ill comports with the pure celestial virtues and amiable qualifications of that lovely fair one. <laughs> That's a hell of a sentence, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's so typical of the 18th century, uh, early 19th century writing. Uh, now, the interesting thing was that the devoto said that, that Fiddler had made a brilliant journey up the uh, Bow River in 1793 and 4. And actually, he had made an overland journey from northern Alberta, from the North Saskatchewan River in 1792 and 3. But uh, apart from that, Devoto was quite correct. But it was this uh, national patriotism of mine that made me say, well, who in the heck is Peter Fiddler? I'd better find out if Lewis and Clark's editors are going to call him names like that. So um, that's the first contact that the white man has on the south side of the line with the Indians that we call the Pegans. Uh, I don't know why uh, we, uh, our government, of course the civil service, uh, does a very strange thing. So why do they spell it that way? Nobody else in this world spells it that way. Uh, the Americans on their side spell it this way. And uh, the Indians themselves spell it, you've seen it, 
Pecani. And Fiddler called them Picano, which one of the Blackfeet boys told me it was a form of the word said we were going to see the Picani, and so you would say the Picano, and that would fit O W. And uh, but uh, David Thompson is the one that really had them. He called them the Piagan. That's the closest he could get to it. <laughs> and you'll find a lot of this variation in, in names. Now, Lewis and Clark didn't recognize who these Indians were. We know that they were Blackfeet and that they were the Pegans, because the Pegan was known to the Hudson Bay Company as the Muddy River Indians. And everybody knows the big muddy is the Mississippi, uh, the Missouri, <laughs> why do I say Mississippi? Missouri is what Fiddler called it, the Missouri River. Well, um, now while they were there, uh, they got into trouble with the Indians, they were careless, and uh, one of the Indians stole some rifles on the horse and uh, and the, uh, they woke up in time and caught them, and they shot one of the Indians. And a number of people were wounded on both sides. Now, this was the first contact with this country, with the Hoopa country, that we have from that side uh, of the line. Now, um, they said that these people traded with the white man, who uh, said that they got goods from a place on the Saskassawan River, which they estimated was six days away, and according to Lewis, six days should be about 150 miles if they travel 25 miles a day. Well, he's talking, of course, about Chesterfield Pouch, which had been opened in 1804 and was opened spasmodically for a few years after. And uh, that's another set of journals that has not been completely published. And when I was down looking up Fiddler, I kind of sneaked a look and read to see what, what they had to say about th this post down there. So that yeah, the closest we've got then, except for Fiddler, and I'm going to put him in pretty soon, uh, all other explorers veered away to the north, following the northern forest with their lakes and rivers, into the Arctic and the Pacific, long before Lewis and Clark. Even David Thompson, who came well southward, crossed the mountains near Rocky Mountain House. So we must face it, nobody wanted our prairies, gopher fur never became a necessity of life, and until there was a demand for buffalo hides that could be carried, not in canoes, you see. Then nobody would bother to come near the Wupa country. Our area had no saleable staple, but it is true that one or two people did cross the area, but for recognizable landmarks before 1840, it's almost impossible. But fortunately for me, and maybe for you, Devoto, when mentioning Fiddler, got me started. And just as I did get started, the the people in Ottawa said, well, you are in luck. You know that we have just completed copying on microfilm all the Hudson Bay Company papers. And if you would like to come down and get permission from the company, we will let you see it. So down I went. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to find out about it. And when you look at the map, um, I had read, for instance, that David Thompson had been uh, along the Bow River in 1800 and no. 1787, when he was a young boy. He doesn't describe them. There's nothing in his journal about it. There's no journal record of it. He goes down. He says he went to the Bow River. That's the uh, uh, bad river, it was called in those days. Only Calgary's bad today. The river is good, see. But it was the bad river, bad or Bow Hills River. And uh, he came back there, and he spent a winter there in about 1804. But his journals don't give that. But when he was an old man, David Thompson decided to write down his memoirs. He was still stinging from the fact that when he got to the Pacific, John Jacob Astor was there and established before he got there. Now, uh, he's been accused of cowardice and delaying and fiddling and shilly-shallying and all the rest of it uh, to get there. He's been blamed for everything. So to justify himself, he decided to show why he went. And interestingly enough, when, the, uh, when he was trying to get to the coast, the Pegans had him stop way up west of Edmonton. He couldn't get through. They were angry at him, and they weren't going to let him trade with anybody west. But some Yankee fellows to the south shot some Pegan Indians. So the message came up, and these fellows all fled away to the south to meet the menace down there, which was Lewis and Carr, and Thompson was able to get them into British Columbia. This shows the coincidence of, of uh, Fiddler, uh, who was the one who started Chesterfield House that uh, Lewis and Clark were talking about uh, was a friend and a uh, follower. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's see, Turner, T-U-R-N-O-R, 
was the official geographer of the Hudson Bay Company. And he had an assistant, David Thompson. David Thompson went over to the Northwest Company and he was replaced by a young Derbyshire fellow named uh, Peter Fiddler. And our Aerosmith's maps shows him, and nobody seemed to know about this, even our Alberta School Act and uh, school books didn't show him. And on, uh, on Aerosmith's map, you get something like this. Mr. Fiddler out. Mr. Fiddler in. <laughs> now that's a great help, that is. So that um, it showed him going, actually, when I got to the book, from Elk Point, which was Buckingham House, all the way down to the Old Man River at the Gap near Lundrake. He was here. Now, uh, the reason why he was not known, why nobody had heard about him, was that he left his books with the Hudson Bay Company. He was a factor at Brandon. They stayed at Brandon House. They got up to Norway House. They stayed there. And finally, in about 1926, the Hudson Bay Company decided to collect up whatever journal survived. And Fiddler's Journal got along with it. And it's tantalizing. Out of about the 500 books that he had, only five survived. And in this journal, he says, in another place, I have collected together many of the words and descriptions of the people's, uh, was it 30 uh, groups of people and, uh, no, 15 groups of people in 30 languages that are spoken. And uh, it would be nice if you could find that book, but it's just not available. And we were lucky to find this. So that, uh, as a result of Devoto then, uh, I decided to find out. Now, uh, can you imagine anybody making a canoe trip up either the Old Man or the Bow River in the middle of winter? <laughs> That'd be quite a trick. Uh, you can do it in the, say, in the month of May or early June, but uh, ask the, the, uh, the boats and bellies on the barges, as I kept calling it. Uh, these books are available. This is Alec uh, Johnson's effort at getting together all the material on our steamboats down here. And this is Mr. Bowman's effort to get away all, get down all the information on the railways that were built in this area at that time. And these are available from the Adult Museum if you, if you care to get them. Uh, this book here uh, uh, is, uh, is an interesting example of what uh, our history shouldn't be written. They said, look, we're trying to get together a regional perspective and uh, we'd like you to do the chapter on the history of Southern Alberta. But uh, give us so many pages, we'll say eight pages double space. Well, I said, well, I can't do it in that. Well, I'll do the best you can. So I, uh, instead of double spacing it, I spaced and a half it. And I, I got in as much as I could, and even then I got an extra page. But I had to jam it all together, and sometimes I put it in brackets so that I wouldn't have to write a whole sentence. And after I got it finished, the editor says, you know, I can give you four more pages now if you want. <laughs> You try, you try and undo a uh, condensation after, and you'll see it's almost impossible. Well, so that started me off. I had to find out where this tooth was. I had to find out all about Fiddler. Now, he seems to be well enough known in northern Manitoba and Saskatchewan. He was the first man to travel up the Churchill River from the mouth to the source, and in 1955, they unveiled a monument to him in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Um, his will was supposed to have been probated in 1969, a year uh, as the century of his birth, you see, he was, uh, no, uh, um, it was uh, 1769 he was born, and two centuries after, and he left the money to be invested for his children, but they broke the will <laughs> within three or four years so that there wasn't any money, but everybody was quite excited. They asked me, what do you think would happen to that will? I said, nothing's going to happen to it. The thing was busticated uh, way back in, in 1800 and something. Well, um, so he got a little notoriety that way. And there are a large number of uh, part Indians in Saskatchewan uh, who were named Fiddler. Um, so that indicates that uh, he wasn't a fictional character. And, uh, but even the Encyclopedia Canadiana just barely mentions him. Now, um, some of his heirs, the ones who would have inherited that estate if, uh, if it had been left intact, would be Mr. Bill Fiddler, who lives in Edgerton, Alberta right now. Uh, he had uh, Bill's sisters, uh, uh, Mrs. Gladys Keeping and Mrs. Floro McEvoy lived in Calgary, and uh, Mrs. Keeping wrote to me, wrote me a letter and uh, said, I'm glad somebody has finally brought our ancestor back to life again, because Fiddler was a very admirable character. He's much more, much easier to read than David Thompson. Uh, Thompson's writing is horrible, 
Now, it's a shame that uh, one Welshman should say that about another one. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fiddler was much nicer writing. Um, so that the... Uh, I can leave on a little of this. Now, I was going to start out, I was going to do a doctoral thesis on this thing. But as the junior college began to grow and uh, things began to fade a little bit, I decided I'd better not. I better let it go. And then James McGregor decided to write a book on Fiddler, which he did, and published it as uh, Peter Fiddler, Alberta's first geographer. I called him uh, Alberta's first surveyor. Now, now the reason I'm interested in, uh, in Fiddler, particularly, is because he came to this part of the country. So here we have a young fellow. August the 18th, 1769, born in Derbyshire, England, in Derbyshire. He was born in the same year as Napoleon, 1769. I remember giving a test in Edmonton once on uh, Napoleon. Very simple question. Could Napoleon have succeeded? And it was a big class, about as big as this, and uh, most of them were teachers who had come back. So instead of answering the question, they told me all they knew about Napoleon. Boy, did we get sick of it. Napoleon was born in Corsica in 1769, over and over and over. <laughs> Nobody had ever asked them that, but they had to show us that they knew it. So um, he came out then, so that you, you just figure how old he was. In 1792, and if he was born in 1769, he was 23 years of age when he came down here. So uh, if some of his behavior, when you read his journal seems a little juvenile. Well, he wasn't that old. And he hadn't that, that much time to, um, to be educated either. Now, when I first mentioned to some of the other people in history that I was uh, doing work on Fiddler, they said to me, have you been to Buckingham House? I said, yes, I went back there. I wanted to find where it was. Well, did you see the well? I thought that was funny. When I went there, the fellow who had a museum at Elk Point said, yes, uh, I've been looking for the well. And I finally said, well, there must be something I'm missing about that well. There's nothing in Fiddler. And then I got a hold of uh, William McGilvery's journal. And in it, see, Fort George and uh, Buckingham House were across the creek from each other. And uh, the well was shared by both of them. And apparently, uh, McGilvery had a quarrel with Thomason in um, Buckingham House. And he threatened to stuff that damned Englishman down the well. And this was, everybody knew that journal because it had been published. And so, said, oh, you've been to Buckingham House. How about that, uh, that well? Well, um, Fiddler then made his journey southward. He started in November the 8th, 1792, until March the 19th, 1793, and he was back there. About as unlikely a time as it is possible to find in Alberta. But fortunately for him, he was landing, uh, heading into the land of the Chinook, which was on his best behavior. And um, now here he is. He's up here um, at Elk Point. Now see, there's Lindbergh. And just down the river, uh, Lindbergh is just down above the river. And when the river moves across this way a little bit, you'll see Buckingham House. And it's about six miles southeast of Elk Point. Now Elk Point is a fairly large town. So Fiddler started off this way, through the area, close to Vegreville, down. Uh, past where Camrose is, through Bittern Lake, south this way, through uh, the Lone Pine Creek area, right across Calgary, south of Calgary, to High River, and 10 miles south of High River, where one of these streams, I think it's Pekisco Creek, branches off right there. And uh, it was he here that he was when they got news that the, uh, the, um, here's the spot that the Katanaha Indians were down in the Napi Uchite Kats River, and they went down there to trade. Uh, now, I want to write that down because I'm going to deviate a little bit from my prepared text, as I say. <coughs> and because as he goes south, he describes everything, the number of mountains, peaks, the angles, the weather, the temperature, everything as he goes along and gives the latitude every once in a while. He uses certain landmarks, for instance, the Devil's Head, you know that mountain 
just north of Calgary. I think it's uh, uh, you, it's in Banff National Park, and it's a it's a peak that looks round at something like that. And uh, that Devil's Head, you can see that as you're traveling south of Red Deer. You notice it first from Red Deer. I think it's about straight east of uh, west of Crossfield. And uh, that was one of his landmarks. And he kept coming south. And then on December the 1st, 1792, he recorded a small thaw overnight. Now, this was very strange because something had happened. He'd never been used to that. He'd never seen that thing before. December, snow melting. He had crossed the Magic Chinook line. As a matter of fact, on December the 7th, in 1792, he was in a position somewhere near Calgary, and the temperature was 58 degrees. He put the bearings 51037 uh, and 113,1935, which puts him somewhere close to Strathmore. And uh, that is usually within five or ten miles of any place that he plots. So he was fairly close to Calgary. Now, what he had run into is our old friend. Uh, the Indians uh, call it this name, and I've had a lot of fun with this. I've tried to write it down. I've got all every Blackfoot student in the country working on it. A six of point. Now, sometimes you won't hear that first part. This is the trouble with Blackfoot name. Certain letters you don't hear. Uh, and so he'll ask him, what's the Chinook called? Six of point. The wind that makes the earth black. Uh, but the, uh, the point was that he was trading with the Indians. As a matter of fact, I've left a whole lot of this out, you know. Uh, for instance, they, they got a little rested one night, so he took some of his rum, and uh, for medicinal purposes, he mixed it with a lot of water, and uh, they um, drank it, and uh, for two days they didn't travel. The first night, it was a bit dismal, it was rather noisy, you know, a lot of howling and running around, and then they seemed to get sober eventually, and then they continued their journey. Uh, so that they seemed to cross the Sheep River to the Highwood, and about March the 3rd, so he seemed to be um, close to the Girl Guide Camp in there. You know where the Sheep River and the Highwood River are together? Well, that's where he crossed. And uh, he made an error in longitude there, and uh, it looked as if he had a locomotive or a taxi. I planned, plotted the whole thing down there, you know. He was here today, and he was here the next day, and he was here the next day, and then all of a sudden he was right. <laughs> Must have left out a zero or something. Uh, so I assumed that he meant here. And, uh, but he kept going down, and then um, he got to the place which he called Spitsy, and uh, we call it Spitsy, and the wolfers lived at Spitsy. I've asked the uh, Indians, you know, the Indian girls who are students here are much better at translating than the boys. The boys will give you a heck of a talk. For instance, they'll say Spitsy uh, means trees on a hill. Well, the best definition I've had of it is that it means that the trees come up out of the river valley. Instead of a steep valley, you've got a flat plain and the trees are high. And the word spitzy in Blackfoot means just that, high. No, nothing else. And uh, so they got there, which was about 10 miles south of High River. A gale from the southwest brought a gentle thaw December the 17th. It was December the 3rd I had up here when I said March the 3rd. Uh, and it blew over a few tents on the 19th. Doesn't that sound like wind, wind, wind? <laughs> well, it never stopped. But um, the thing is that, that uh, delighted me mostly about it was that he said the inns seems happy when these winds blows. And uh, I thought about how many non inns have been happy when these winds blows after about two weeks of below zero weather. Uh, now, uh, on December the 30th, then, he decided to go off with the Indians. Now, I'm going to write this down because I, I have no other way of, of doing it. He spelled it. He was, a, he was a phonetic speller, so he spelled it differently every time. Uh, this way. i got to keep going. And no Blackfoot Indian that I've ever met can tell me what it means. Uh, there's, as far as I know, there's no chip there. But I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. I'm going to wander away from this. But he says, this is the place 
where an old man played a game called poop and dart. And there are many descriptions of it, so I got the Glenbow Foundation to help me to find out about the origin of the Old Man River. And uh, here it is. Um, this is from two sources. One, Clark Wessler's Mythology of the Blackfoot Indians, which was published in 1908. And this is the diary of Dr. Augustus Jukes, who was with the Mounted Police as, as doctor between 1882 and 1886. And from those two, um, I want you to notice this. Uh, this is the way Fiddler wrote Nat P. This is Nat P. You know, the old man. You can recognize that. Uh, Mr. Dr. Jukes wrote it this way. Um, let's see. Uh, how did he put those two letters? I'm trying to figure out just exactly how he did it. Oh, yeah. And then his diary, he wasn't sure whether it was not the O or not the U, so he put the U up on top of the O so you could take your choice. And uh, this is the way uh, this thing comes up. Now, here's, um, I'd better read what I, what I have here. In Wessler's Mythology of the Blackfoot Indians, there, there are the two following extracts. Far up in the north, there is a place known as the Old Man's Gambling Place. Uh, there is where the old man played the game of arrows and the rolling wheel. The game is called Itsiwa. Itsiwa. Is that what he's trying to say here? I don't know. It's sounds more like ooch, because uh, I don't think the ch sound. Uh, it's rather interesting. Some, I was asking somebody if there was such a sound in the Blackfoot language. <laughs> Suddenly remember there's no, that sound doesn't exist in Welsh either. There's no chiff sound in the Welsh language. Well, um, now this game, the old man used to play. They rolled this little wheel, and somebody threw an arrow at it, and you, uh, there, there were different color spokes. And depending on if you got it through, you scored different points, you see. And uh, the, uh, the, the trick was to hit it before it hit the log at the end. And the people used to bet on it. And I, I'm going to show you a little diagram pretty soon uh, of what this thing looked like. Now, um, he gambled, and he always lost. Now, that's quite a god. So he would join them, and he lost every time his robe and his moccasins. And as soon as he took them off to give to the people who had won them, the robe became back fat, and the moccasins became buffalo tongues. And as the winner had no use for such things, he gave them back at once. Then the old man put the tongues on his feet, and they became moccasins, and put the back fat on his shoulders, and it became a robe. So he gambled again and again, always with the same result. Sounds like the, the, the game was fixed, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, through the courtesy of Hugh Dempsey, I have the following from the diary of Dr. Augustus Jukes of 1882 to 1886. And he refers to a French-Canadian who had been in the West 71 years. That means he had been there since 1811. And he was 88 years old at the time. The tradition of the Blackfoot is that the founder of their nation was a man whom they call Nhapio, who lived to a great age and did many wonderful things in the country lying between the Bow River and the mountains, which from time immemorial had been their dwelling place and hunting ground. Um, it's called the Old Man's Home, in uh, McLean's book called Savage Folk. Now, some 40 miles west of Fort McLeod, which stands on the Old Man's River, <coughs> or probably the Ancient Man's River in their language, at a certain point on the high land near the upper part of the river, there still remain, and I hope someday to visit them, two very large circular stones as round and smooth as marble, and stretching away from them to a considerable distance, smooth, deep furrows are worn in the rock. They seem to have been rolled to and fro until a deep channel has been made. And these great round stones are said to be those, uh, said by those who have often seen them, uh, though a few know where to find them, to be some three and a half to four feet in diameter. The Blackfeet called these Na, or Nhapio stones, and the place where they lay in the valley of the river they called Napio's playground. Now this is a second version of, uh, of this. He is said to be a man of great stature, and he wandered all over this Blackfoot country. 
were many remarkable circular based conical piles of stone from four to six feet high surround a circle of other stones and two lines of stones crossing each other at exact right angles. Now you recognize the medicine wheel and all these other things. Now, when Fiddler went down there, um, oh, there's one other thing about this. There is a place where it says, north of Cypress Mountain on the plain towards the Belly River and another on the Bow River, uh, there are places where he lay with his body straight and his arms stretched out on each side at right angles. And they're still called by the Indians Napio Itzorchan, uh, meaning uh, the uh, place where the old or ancient man slumbered. Now this man and his playground near it have given its name to the river, the old man's river. Now at that time, these people, none of them knew anything about the gap in the North Fork of the old man river, as we called it. And uh, when Fiddler uh, was down there, what he did, he went down to the... Um, to the racehorse, and I'll show you, I've got it marked here. And he said, as you get into the gap, there is a place, and I drew it very carefully there. Uh, this thing here is about 45 yards long, and it's made of stones placed close together. And then there's these little stones shaped like a heart in a circle, and another little circle with a triangle in there. And Fiddler has the, me the measurements down. And then all around them are piles of stones where he figured the judges would sit to see that nobody cheated. Apparently there's a lot of money on these, and a lot of women too, probably they, you know, they used to bet their women. Uh, this is probably the most valuable property that some of them had, because you know how many horses you have to get for a good wife in those days, and you didn't uh, lose her lightly. But this is a picture of Napi Pi Uchitekats as Fiddler found it. Now, what I'm interested in uh, is this, that uh, I find the spot. And he said, they give this ridiculous account of no pi wuchitekans. A white man, remember, no pi implies white man, doesn't it? How many of you have any knowledge of black folk? Uh, but uh, apparently that word no pi implies a white man. It says, a white man came from the south ages ago and built this place that I just showed you for the Indians to play at. That is, different nations whom he wished to meet here annually and bury all animosities betwixt the differing tribes by assembling and playing here. Doesn't sound like our winter games. <laughs> uh, it's not that this isn't the first stadium that's built. And it isn't everybody that has the god of the Blackfoot to build a stick. Well, uh, if it had been early, we might have said that, but uh, it wasn't, was it? Um, so, we have a combination of the Olympic Games and the United Nations on the Old Man River. And I think our, the building is a little prettier than the cracker box of the United Nations. So Fiddler even then got to smoke four puffs of the peace pipe, which was an, almost a royal salute. And then um, he climbed a mountain. Now it's, on the, it's the mountain on the south side of the Old Man River in the Gap. How many of you are familiar with the Livingstone Gap that the Old Man comes to? You know, it's where the North Fork, uh, the, the ranchers drive their cattle up. He climbed that mountain. It took him two and a half hours, and he got a tremendous view. And he looked out and saw our country. He must be the first white man who looked over this wonderful country, the garden spot of America, Jimmy Durante would say. And this is what he said before he left it. This land, all this land in this country is a fine, light, sandy soil and will produce excellent crops of all kinds of grain, the seasons here being so very mild. Remember, Fiddler, when I talk about Palestine. <laughs> because uh, this is what he said. Of course, he only saw it in the winter. And he's the only man who saw it in the winter. And uh, so then he went back and went north. He passed close to Drumheller because he, he measured the seams of coal in the in the Edge Coal Creek, as he called it, probably Rosebud Creek. And when he went to Buffalo Lake, coming back, uh, he said that he met, he saw so many buffalo there that he couldn't count them. They, were, they darkened the ground, and as far as he could see in all directions, there was nothing but a sea of buffalo. And if you know that spot, it's by Buffalo Lake, it's where the half-breeds used to come every year to hunt. 
and there are their little villages there, and I think some of their cemeteries are still there for these to come to hunt these buffalo in the in the uh, summertime. Now, uh, there's a lot more, of course, on Fiddler, but as as I as you realize, I haven't got that much time to talk about them uh, because um, uh, there there are so many uh, other things that I'll, I'll have to get onto. But I I don't want to bore you too much tonight. There are one or two things about uh, Fiddler's journey down here, though, that are, are worth noting. One is, um, in one of the, in the journal, here, I think I, I have it noted somewhere, he gives descriptions of, <clears throat> he's the first man, white man, to see Chief Mountain. And he called it, uh, this is interesting, he said a mountain leaning away towards the east, and he, um, he, he named it this way. Now, that puzzled for a while because I didn't know exactly how to pronounce it. But what he's trying to do with the Q-U-E is to say Ku, the black people. Now, according to Hugh Dempsey, and you know Hugh Dempsey's wife is Senator Gladstone's daughter, so she's an expert in Blackfoot. Uh, she said it's, it's very simple, really. It's Ninas, which means chief, and top, Ku, which means mountain. It doesn't mean old chief or anything else. It means Ninas, top, chief mountain. And uh, Fiddler said, it is called by these people the king or by our people, meaning the Crees, the governor of the mountains. He knew it was an important chief, and he didn't know how to translate it. So in one language, he called it the king, and the other, the governor of the mountains, the great chief, you see. And uh, yet, actually, Ninastakku, which is the, uh, the, the left word for it, is uh, spelled that way. And if you look up, this is the difficulty with Blackfoot, if you look up the uh, uh, American side in Glacier Park, you'll find that they've mi mistaken the N for an M. Now, whether the South Peak and say Minas Taku, I don't know. But uh, most of them have Ninas Taku. And then the, the other thing that he did was describe the hunting of the buffalo. Um, it says, I found 11 tents here and a buffalo pound. These 11 tents had been here five days and had made a pond in this pound, the three sides of which were made of wood, being a strong fence about five foot high in a creek, one side of which was steep where the buffalo came in. They got a few in just before we arrived. Great numbers of buffalo are near this place. After, just after we arrived, they brought in a small herd of about 50 into it and killed every one. The pound within is about 50 yards long and 20 wide. And then he says, the cliff that bore 67 uh, 76 degrees west this morning now bears north 87 west. <laughs> he sticks that in. And then uh, he goes back to his buffalo hunting. He said that the dead men that the Indians have at this pound are made, they know what dead men are. They're just piles of uh, either brush or manure behind which people men are. They're trying to drive the buffalo into the pound. So the boys and the old men have to lie down behind these dead men. And then as the buffalo go by, uh, they have to stand up and wave and shout and uh, to keep them going because the Indians had a superstition, especially over the buffalo jump. Uh, uh, Fiddler said that at one buffalo jump, I think it's old woman buffalo jump around that, and this is where he was. He said that uh, they told him that they must never let a buffalo get out of that. They had to kill them all because if they did, they would, if any got away, they'd tell the other buffalo and you could never get them into that for a long time after. Well, that very day, they chased buffalo over, and a couple of them were crippled, but they hobbled away, and they couldn't catch them. And you know, for five days after that, they couldn't get any buffalo into that pond. They'd turn away every time. So they must have brought the news back. Well, um, now this is what they say about the dead men. Four or six pieces of buffalo dung uh, made up about knee high, and it goes from the pond on both sides about a mile or more. Several Indians lay flat on the ground at these hills, and as the buffalo passes them, they rise up and follows them, running to keep the buffalo upon a constant gallop. For should they not be driven on fast, they would be aware of the danger and step from the right road into the pound. 
When woods are near, the dead men are made of small bundles of branches, all having a start towards the pound. Fresh breezes at the southwest, rather hazy. <laughs> Sounds like he's having, having an attack. Um, now at 8 a.m., they brought a herd of buffalo into the pound, and an hour after they brought in another before all the first was killed. In the afternoon, they brought in several more head near the pound, but they all broke out amongst the dead men, and not a single one got into the pound. Yesterday, there was a great ceremony of smoking was made in our tent, the principal part of all the old men assembling, and several speeches were made, the purport of which was that they might get good luck in getting the buffalo back into the pound so that they would run the way the Indian men wanted them to run. Now, this is the... Um, he, he keeps coming back to this, you see. Our chief is the pound master, and whenever a herd comes into the pound, he must go and kill the first one. And he does it with a gun. Doesn't that sound like the president of the untied states of America is throwing the first ball, or, or the prime minister of Canada kicking off for the great cup? <laughs> and then the rest of the men go in and kill them with arrows, or bayonets tied to the end of a pole, ankh. The hatchet is frequently used, and it is shocking to see the poor animals thus pent up without any way of, of escaping, being butchered in this shocking manner. Some with a stroke of an axe will open nearly the whole side of a buffalo, and the poor animal runs sometimes a considerable while all through the pounds with its interrolls dragging on the ground and being trod on by the others before they die. <laughs> Literal. And that's their interrolls. <laughs> you could spell enter it, but, well, it is easy. Now this is an actual, this isn't David Thompson remembering 10 years ago. This is an actual reported first-hand account of a buffalo hunt in our southern Alberta. Um, he said, sometimes the buffalo, a fresh herd, will come into the pound while the women are employed in cutting up the buffalo and taking out the best parts. And uh, it says, which makes them run headlong over the hedge to escape. Much to the amusement of the men, of course, who think it's a big joke to make the women run like that. Sometimes the Indians say a few are killed by the buffalo before they can get out. <laughs> this is why I like to read this journal. It's full of things like this. Uh, I don't know who it, this is. Uh, what, see, these fellows used to write a trail copy, and then they wrote a finished, a fine copy. And uh, the fine copy was what this one was, because he very often did it years later, and he very often talks about things that happened after. And they pop up, just like that weather popped up in the middle of a buffalo hunt. Can't remember, can't forget that weather, you got to get it in. Well, um, there's another thing in here, I, I can't find the spot, but uh, he said, I soon learned to slow down in the evening as we came to the camping place, so that when we arrived at the camping, camping spot, the women already had the tents pitched <laughs> and the supper's cooked. In other words, an Englishman at the age of 23 had learned the secret of how to get out of cooking supper. Um, but this is what I said. I, I, I didn't want to give you any more uh, of the speeches that I made because I'd rather read from the journal. There is another interesting thing in here. There's a blood Indian living with these Pegans, with these Pekani. And he's a great fortune teller. The Bloods apparently were the fortune tellers for these people. And uh, uh, some of the men had gone down to steal horses from, they were the best horse stealers in the business. That gets them into trouble with the mounted police later, but uh, in 1792 and 93, they're doing all right. And they hadn't come back. So they went to this blood Indian, and from the snakes, see that the horses were on the other side of the mountain. Most of the great horse ranges were the Appaloosas, you know, the Palouse country in Washington. That's where most of the horse raising was done. And when the when the Kootenays came across the mountain, they brought horses with them. And uh, when they traded the horses, they, they traded just about everything they had uh, with, with these people, so that the women were staggering, carrying the tents after the trading was over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be a woman uh, in those halcyon days. But he got himself together. He had his thumbs and his fingers tied together. And uh, he was in some sort of a little tent with a lot of little buffalo bones that would jingle like anything. And, and they covered him with another tent. And he went in there, and pretty soon they heard noises and shakings and all the rest of it. And then he came out after making, uh, seeing visions, I suppose. Then he came out and he said, the boys will be back at Spitzy in two days. 
And uh, so they left where they were and went back to Spitzy, and two days later the boys turned up tired and foot sore because they hadn't been able to steal any horses and the horses they had had played out and so they had to take turns at riding the few that they had left. One ran and the other rode, you see. And uh, Fiddler just shook his head and said, of course, it's just just luck, you know. <laughs> he wouldn't believe that these fellows were. Well, this is uh, what I mean by our, our country at the earliest. And uh, that's why I like to read Peter Fiddler's journal so much is because of the, it's the picture of the Blackfoot civilization at its highest peak because in another century by 17 by 1892 the Blackfeet are going to be a pretty poor bunch of people they're going to have had smallpox attacks and they had a they had some bad ones there was one in 1771 that nearly wiped them out but they had recovered by this time but uh, they had smallpox and they had measles so that when the whiskey traders come, when we come down to that period, it wasn't the same group of people. These people at, at, at the uh, Highwood River would go down in the morning and break the ice in the Highwood River and swim in the water to toughen their body. Now that's the Blackfeet. When, when, you, when you, you look at the Indian and you don't think too much of him, remember him when he was at his best. And that was in 1793 when a little English fellow 23 years of age, went into their tent and smoked the pipe, and they did a lot of fancy gestures, so he said, I did one to the east and one to the west and one to the north and one to the south, and then I made a fancy swirl, and they thought that that was some magic <laughs> that I passed the pipe on. Well, he was young enough to do that. So I, I'll, I'll quit there, and the next day I'll go on into the ranching period and the, uh, the whiskey period, and the coming of the mounted police. I don't know how well we'll be able to get it. And then the next week, you're going to have to suffer through my researches on the early city of Lethbridge and its sister city, McLeod. You have been listening to the first of a series of tapes on Southern Alberta history, recorded in 1974 by Dr. James Cousins.